today's guest believes that the profound work of a woman is to bring civility and order out of chaos, to bring beauty and intelligence and excellence to her community, and that we need to turn our homes into a life-giving haven for all who enter. This is our third episode in our May is for the Mom series this month, and this will actually be my guest's second time on The Spillover. Every episode this month is for women. Parenting, God's design for us, homemaking, and even etiquette are what you can look forward to. And this time, I have questions for my guest on the best ways to make friends as an adult, how to know when to break up with friends, and questions submitted by cute conservatives on everything from beating the odds and sustaining a spirit-filled marriage to how you can use your home to bless others, even when you're chronically ill or bedridden. She's authored more than two dozen books, including a brand new coffee table book called Tea Time Discipleship. It's full of beautiful pictures and recipes and how-tos so we can feel encouraged and capable enough to minister God's love to others over a cup of tea. It couldn't be more perfect for the show. We are talking friendship and more. Please welcome author Sally Clarkson to The Spillover. The last time we spoke, Sally, we talked about your book, The Life-Giving Home. Now you have a brand new book that has beautiful pictures and journal prompts and even some recipes, which you called Tea Time Discipleship, which I have next to me. (laughs) What about this book do you think that fans of The Life-Giving Home will really enjoy? Well, I people have asked me forever to do a book that had recipes that had a peek into my home. Um, that had some, uh, you know, just lots of beautiful things. And I just can't believe it. My publisher came to my house and took a thousand pictures. And we had so much fun uh, for several days. And and so I think that people will love um, even the beginning. Can I read you the beginning? Please. Uh, it's like the life-giving home, but it says, Our home and table can be a sanctuary for life, a holding place for all of our ideals, an atmosphere of love and energy that engages dreams and inspiration. The profound work of a woman is to bring civility and order out of chaos, to bring beauty, intelligence, and excellence to her community, and to subdue her kingdom of home into a life-giving home. So it's it has a lot of the same spirit, but it's also visual. And I also have a reason I wrote it, which I will eventually tell you about. <laughs> no, tell us now. Tell us. Well, I think that as I look at um, as I look at just general uh, all of the values that we have in culture, we have these to do lists and these checklists and all of these different things. But I think sometimes uh, people think that taking time for yourself, fifteen minutes a day, is frivolous. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I I just didn't get to it today. But when I talk about the heart and the soul and the mind of a person, you can't grow intellectually without reading. Um, you can't really grow in your faith without spending one brick a day to build a kingdom of faith. Um, you really can't have peace in your heart if you aren't taking time to center all of the pressures and issues. So I wanted to write a book to say to all of my friends, um, if you take time, 15 minutes a day, for yourself to to bring beauty, civility, to take a breath, to put away all the stresses, uh, to grow intellectually, spiritually, you will be a different person because all kingdoms were built one brick at a time. And um, if you don't have on your checklist a way that the garden of your soul, so to speak, is going to grow, it will not grow. It will dry up. Uh, it has to be watered every day in order for it to flourish well. So it's really getting to the heart of femininity or womanhood or humanhood, um, humanity, you have to invest in yourself if you're giving out on a constant basis or else you will become depleted and dry. Mm. One of the th- one of the themes that you dive into in this book, which I was really happy to see, was friendship. And you talk about how you really struggled with loneliness when you first became a mom. You longed for these deep friendships with other adult women, but you really had trouble finding them. And you kind of felt like your family, the Clarksons, were the ones to reach out and host people and invite <laughs> people over, but nobody was really reciprocating and doing that for you guys. How did you eventually find those deep friendships as a mother? Um, I, I had been overseas uh, working with students and in missions and with adults for many years when I got married and when I finally um, had my first child. But I was particularly lonely then because, uh, you know, it's a, it's a whole new uh, game and you have a whole new set of, of 
ideals and standards and, and schedule. Um, but I think I just learned to ease what I had done before. I would put out an announcement on Facebook or if I wasn't part of a some kind of a fun social group, I would say, does anyone want to come to my house and be friends and have a cup of tea or whatever? And um, I just learned that there are a lot of people out there who really want friendship, but they're overwhelmed already with their lives and think, I can't add one more thing. And again, I knew that friendship, community, uh, support systems, someone to say, you too, me too, uh, is essential to our long-term well-being. If we ever find ourselves in a place where we're very depressed or we have a terrible illness or a car crash or whatever, sadness, and we don't have someone to help carry the load, um, we're going to find ourselves just depleted and empty without any place to go. So um, I, I just realized many years ago I needed to be the one who hit the ball and hope that somebody would hit it back. So you were the initiator, and I know so many women, including myself, we want someone to initiate friendship with us. And right. so we can get stuck in this cycle of loneliness and sitting around and hoping that someone will ask us to get together. But you talked about how actually Jesus did the complete opposite of that. So could you talk about that? Well, I think I had another quote that I was just reading this morning. I'm working on another project. But um, I think that as I saw that— uh, He came to us uh, while we weren't even looking for him. Um, He washed feet. He took children in his arms. He served meals. uh, He reached out. And and then he said, in the same way that I've loved you, you go out and love other people. And um, and so I would have my quiet time and I would think, you know what? Um, If I love uh, with my words, then I am loving with the love of Jesus. If I uh, make just one cup of tea, it's kind of like when he said, if you give just one cup of water, uh, you know, it matters. And so I I would just watch his pattern of friendship, community building, and so on. And um, that has been my pattern for my whole life. It's why I do what I do today. I just, I am so glad. It's like I have sunshine in my heart the more I embrace and really understand his ways. Why is it so important for adults to overlook personality characteristics that we find irritating in potential friends? Well, I do think that a part of uh, a part of reaching out, starting groups, um, is you are going to find humanity there. There <laughs> are going to be people that you you need to read the book boundaries. <laughs> there are going to be people that you need to say they were that way before I ever got to them. Um, I didn't make them be whatever hateful or mean or demanding. And and so there are ways in which we do. Um, it's a part of growing and maturity. We are called to love people. But they don't need to be, we don't have to take on every single person's life that we meet. Um, But what I found is that my best friends, and you probably have this too, when you work with a group of friends on projects or when when you do a conference or when you um, have a Christmas party, we would always have a Christmas tea and then a summertime where we invited all the fathers, all the husbands to our group, uh, to our mom's group. I had other single women group too. But... um, I think that there's a part of seasoning. The older you get, the more you realize, I am a flawed person. I am actually oh, yeah. a pet. <laughs> yes. And the more, um, the older you get, the more you are humbled and the more compassion you have for people. I think when you're busy and uh, too wrapped up in your own life, it's harder to have compassion on people. Can I say something that might sound mean, but I don't mean it in a mean way. Just helpful advice, okay? The other night when I was out, this guy was talking to my friends and I, and we asked him to guess how old we all were. And when he got to me, he was like, hmm, well, you don't have any wrinkles around your eyes at all, so I'm going to say 25. I think I had an out-of-body experience because I'm 30 and most girls my age I know are starting to get fine lines and wrinkles around their eyes. Now, one girl I know has them particularly bad, but you know what I've been doing religiously since my mid-20s? Strategic small amounts of Botox in key areas like around the eyes. I'm just going to be honest with you. Everybody like flips out when I say that. It's like, well, I could just gatekeep it, but no, I'm telling you. So stop yelling at me. Also, I have always done a rigorous skincare routine, including eye cream since I was about 18. Now, this combo, I believe, has really worked in my 
favor. And I use Nimi Skincare, which is a conservative-owned skincare brand that won't ever support woke initiatives. They believe in femininity, family, faith, and freedom, and they are made in the USA. Retinol is the key ingredient in their hydrating moisturizer. You need it today. Try Nimi at NimiSkincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. That's N-I-M-I Skincare.com with code Alex Clark for 10% off. And I bet you'll start getting the same compliments. Click the link in the description to try. Let's say that we do it, okay? We're super brave. We invite this non-believer friend over for tea. They accepted. Now they're sitting right next to us. How do you even just casually start talking about Jesus in a natural, non-awkward way with someone that you've invited over to your home? Okay, so I have this barista in Oxford where I live. And I thought, you know what? I, I've seen them every day for a year. They're my favorite person because they make my favorite coffee. And so I said, would you like to come to my house sometime? I just would love to get to know you. And this person came and I said, tell me your story. Uh, you know, you, you just ask questions that get to the heart. I said, I would love to know where did you grow up? Um, what was your family like? You know, tell me um, some of you know the highlights and um when they would tell me, I would respond. You know, we, we hit the ball back. We, and I would say, um, oh, I said, I never knew that. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Oh, my goodness. What, a, what a, an incredible life you've lived. Whatever it is, you respond with sympathy as you would to someone in your family or a child or a friend or whatever. And this wonderful person said to me, do you know in my whole life no one has ever once invited me over for a cup of tea? or for anything for that matter. I've just been alone for many years, and this is the highlight of my whole life. I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my goodness, um, had I known this, you know, I would have made 30 minutes for her ahead of time. I mean, another time. But I think there are so many people who would love to be invited in. And it's just a matter of, you know, sometimes uh, it works, most of the time it works, when you really care about someone, when you look them in the eye, when you prepare for them, um, when you say, I'm so glad you came today. Um, and I mean, that's what you and I are waiting for, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can come to my house. I will spoil you. <laughs> well, and you are such a good listener. And like your just your ability, what you're describing, exactly how to respond and react when somebody's telling you their story and things like that to make them feel cherished and loved and heard. What are some ways that you can train yourself to be a good listener and ask really good questions? Um, I think that there are so many great um, articles, books, um, you know, you can Google and find out how to be a good friend. But I think that being a really good friend um, it starts with your heart. And um, I decided, I was writing in my journal one day, and I decided that one of my goals was going to be to leave a bit of God's love, a bit of my love with every person I ever met. And of course, I, I'm not 100% of that, but um, when I go someplace and my children always roll their eyes and laugh at me, um, I'll say, oh, I love your watch, or oh, that you are, make the best cup of coffee I've ever seen. I go to a lot of coffee shops. And um, I only make tea at home because I can only make it right. <laughs> That's how I feel with my iced chai tea latte. Isn't that funny? You, you kind of know what's right. Um, and it's always weak when I go places. But anyway, um, I just started making it a habit to look in their eyes to look at them in context um, and not to judge them if they were different than me. Um, to to really, uh, when Jesus said, if I have washed your feet, so you need to do to others. And so I would just look for opportunities to um, kind of get into the, the story. Mm. And I know that most people, not everyone, there are some evil people in the world, but most people uh, long for someone to invest time care, affirming words uh, in their lives. And, um, you know, if somebody doesn't respond, it's kind of, you, you don't worry about it. You shake the dust off your feet and move on. But I do feel like uh, I, I wherever I go, I have just been so blessed to have a lot of people that I was able to bring into just some small perimeters in my life to love them. And um, I do think it becomes a habit. The more you do it, I had a group of leaders at my house um, a few years ago that I was training in, in some leadership skills. 
And um, several of the women said, oh, I would never talk to my neighbor. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and I thought, okay, let's come up with 10 questions, you know, you could ask or, or say, you know, like, you have the cutest dog in the world. Everybody wants someone to admire their dog. Or, and their um, baby. And their baby. Maybe oh, not their God. husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you can even just write down in a journal, um, these are five questions I can go to. Um, maybe I should write a book on friendship. Maybe you and I should write a book on friendship together. Oh, gosh. Well, I would for sure read it if you wrote it. I, I mean, this is one of the biggest things I think that I get asked to do episodes on, and um, I haven't really gone into it that much. I had my very best friend on, and so we kind of talked about our friendship. But as far as giving advice on how as an adult, how as a stay-at-home mom, am I supposed to meet new people? Um, I've had <laughs> lots of questions about that. Well, I I would always do like right. Uh, I have this Bible study that I love in um, Oxford. We've been together now for three years, and um, really, people didn't know one another to begin with. I just literally put out on Facebook, "Does anyone want to come together for a meal, or you know, to make friendship, whatever?" I did something very general, and it, most of them didn't know each other to begin with. Um, and they came, and and you know, I I said, "I'm so glad you're here. Why don't we read a book together?" or and I always had some kind of food. And now they've become friends. Their children bec- have become friends. They go to all these wonderful places together. I'm going to the museum next week. Who wants to come? Um, you know, we're, we're going to walk in the, um, in the uh, pathway and, and, and go have fish and chips. Who wants to come? And so because by God's grace, I've learned how to reach out and to love because that's, I feel so I feel so blessed in my life. Um, then all of these women have not only become my friends, but they've become each other's friends. Yeah. And they've invited other people in. And so uh, to begin with, the first time when I had the meeting, they were like this. Yeah, everybody's very nervous and closed off. Yeah. And um, I just, you know, I, I think having food and saying, I'm so glad you're here. And this is such a small room. Thank you for sitting on the floor or whatever it was. Um. And then I just shared a little bit of my story, and I said, "Can I would love to know some of your stories. So, so yeah, what and, are your icebreakers when you're getting a group of women that don't know each other together trying to start friendships? What are some fun things that you throw out that you're like, this is like always in my bag of tricks? Well, it's easy in Oxford because no one is from there. <laughs> you can say, where are you from? What brought you here? How long have you been here? Oh, really? I don't, you know, I don't know where that is. That's where my favorite cafe is. So you you just have people share say and um it's gotten to the point now where i have to limit it we we have what we call a mintro a mintro is a minute intro ooh and so we'll say say everything you can possibly let us know about yourself in 1 minute and of course some people you know give almost no knowledge well you know i've lived here right and how and, then, and what do you do with those women that it's really hard for I them say, to open up i not enough i want to know <laughs> something really personal what's the most personal thing and then everybody laughs and You know, but it's just, uh, I think if you get old enough, I'm almost 70, and I don't care anymore. I don't care what people think anymore. Um, But it is fun. Um, I've done this for years, and I believe that most of the people I ever meet, I'm sure that I have offended people along the way. I've gotten letters. but um, Really? Magical things happen in girls' bathrooms, especially after 10 p.m. Whether it's a late-night dinner or you're out for drinks at that time, girls are so friendly, they're bonding, they're sharing secrets, they're hyping up each other's outfits. It's just a secret world in language that men can never and should never understand, which is why Garnu makes feminine products for girls only. A lot of organic tampons come with crappy cardboard applicators, and they're still owned by woke companies, not Garnu. 100% organic cotton tampons with BPA-free plastic applicators. They're made without dyes, fragrances, chlorines, no titanium dioxide either. They are conservative-owned and sell menstrual cups too, if that's your vibe. Also, every purchase fights human trafficking in Nepal. Join the Girls Only Club by going to garnu.com slash spillover with code spillover for 15% off your first month of organic tampons when you subscribe exclusively for Spillover listeners. The code can be used for one-time purchases as well, not just subscriptions. G-A-R-N-U-U dot com slash spillover with code spillover for 15% off or click the link in the show notes. 
what are some of the things that people write letters? You mean based on your books or people that you've met in real life? Oh, I think sometimes what I've always told my children that if you stand up in front of an audience, um, you become an easy target. Yeah. So oh, do there, I know that? Yeah. <laughs> so there are people, you know, part of learning how to deal with all of this, uh, there are people who um, may get irritated by what you believe or what you say or what you do or the color of shirt you have on. It doesn't really matter. But in general, I have found people to be generous, to be kind, um, to laugh at my mistakes. You know, I was telling um, someone that sometimes by being humble, it's easier to open a heart. Mm. And um, I had this group at my house here in Colorado, where I am right now. And um, this woman came out with a really big smile on her face. I just told the story to someone else. And I said, oh, you seem you seem like you're giggling about something. And she said, I just couldn't believe it. Sally Clarkson has a cracked toilet seat. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, yes, I do. I've got boys in the house and somebody hit it. You know, a, a shelf dropped down on it. And But she said, well, I've got one too. Oh, and um, I realized we feel more at ease when we feel like we're not talking to a perfect person. Yes, absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Have you ever had to have a friend breakup, though, like uh, where you knew or they knew that this friendship wasn't going to work for whatever reason, it became toxic? And then how did you handle the confrontation with that or the grief that came with that loss? I think that I've learned over the years. I read about this in one of my last books. I don't remember which one, but... um I think that there that's going to happen inevitably. We are in a broken world. A lot of people have never been trained in any way to give grace or love. Mm. Uh, and um, one thing I did learn from a very toxic breakup that just really crushed me is I, I have this mental file drawer in heaven. And I learned to put some of what I was feeling, I wrote it down in the journal, put it in the file drawer of heaven and close it because... Um, it it really poisons you to rehearse. She said this, and we did that, and that wasn't fair. But it it poisons you when you whatever you uh, water is going to grow. And so I, I did learn over the years because it's happened to us numerous times, um, not to give a toxic situation power in my life, whether I need to go to a counselor, a friend, or just where I I just need to give it up because. The more you think about something hateful, the more um, bitter you become. So that's one thing I learned. And, um, you know, another thing I learned was just because I'm in the public eye a lot and I have lots of people in my life, is I, I became more seasoned at looking at um, maybe principles or things that people showed that weren't healthy. There's yeah. a great book called, um, what is it, Safe People. That um, And it just lists 10 different factors about people that maybe aren't safe. Ooh. And then the third thing I, I had to realize, because I'm a feeler and I love people and I take things on, is that oftentimes um, people were broken before I ever got to them. Um, I did not make them broken. Mm -hmm. um, it is not my responsibility that they're broken. I can be as gracious as I possibly can be because I want to be gracious. I don't have to take them on, but it's... Everything in the world is not my fault. Right. And um, I think that when I learned about toxic people, um, I would, you know, give grace, love, reach out. But it was helpful for me to say, I think that's a you problem. It, that's not something that I created or would ever create. And that's that's in a very specific kind of situation. But it would it helped me to not be self-critical, like, oh, everything is my fault. Um, it helped me to learn how to say, no, I really love the Lord. I'm going to pray for that person. But I don't need to take the baggage of everything on myself, especially yeah. because there will be people that are difficult um, to get along with that maybe aren't at the inner circle of your life. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And now, now I'm totally going to be filing away all of these things in my file drawer for heaven. <laughs> I love that. I love that. No, just release it. You know, it just doesn't help to carry it. Yes. So um, since we 
Since our last interview, I asked our listeners, hey, I got to ask all of my questions for Sally the first time, but this time I really want you to submit questions. And man, I got some good ones, and I got some ones that really put my problems in perspective. Um, So let's go through some of these. One listener wrote in with a question saying, I have social anxiety, but I would love to invite random people over to 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 get to know them better. How do I push through? You know, I, I think that one of the things, and I actually am writing this in another book, but um, I, I think that when we understand that we have capacity and we need to stretch our capacity a little bit at a time, um, there there used to be things that absolutely made me fearful. Um, you know, I would I would get anxious. I would think, oh, who am I to speak to these people? And um, once I did it a whole bunch of times, then... I got over my anxiety. I had to grow in my capacity. But the other thing is also that we have agency. And agency is that we have the ability to, little by little, to grow um, forward in in the you know relational muscle, spiritual muscle, whatever. But um, I think that sometimes when you focus on having compassion or sympathy for people, and and really focus in on that instead of how am I doing or how am I performing. Mm. Uh, it, it can help change your attitude. But the other thing I want to say is we all have personalities. And there it is no perfect personality. And maybe being um, reaching out socially would be hard for you, but you could make someone a, a plate of cookies and drop it by with a note and say, I'm praying for you. Yes, or, and I always tell people it just starts with hi. All yeah. you have to do is just say hello, whether that's a neighbor, somebody that's living on your apartment complex floor, somebody at work. Just say right. hi the first time. Don't put any pressure on yourself to say anything else. The next time, maybe hi and a compliment. I love your hair today. I love your shirt today. The next time, exactly. hey. Like very you know, good advice. So I always try to tell them to start in, do it in increments. You don't have to put the pressure no. on you. Like, I need to invite them over to my home, you know, the very first time that I ever talk to them, too. Right. No, they just need to see that when they see you and pass you in the street, it's really fun to see you because you care about them. Yes. So another listener says she's chronically ill and even bedridden a lot of the times. And so she feels called to invite people over as well. But she struggles not because she doesn't want to or social anxiety, but because her home is messy due to her not being able to clean a lot. What would you say to that woman? Um, I was just talking with a friend about that. Um, I actually, many, many years ago, when I was a single woman living in Vienna, um, I was kind of lonely and I couldn't speak the German language and I didn't know what to do. And this woman who had three children, maybe four, seemed like a thousand to me. Um, and she invited me over. She said, I bet you're kind of lonely. And, um, and so when I went in, there were toys everywhere. There, you know, there were little cookies here and there. There were all sorts of stuff. And she went, you know, my house isn't perfect, but I thought maybe we can be friends. And she took her arm and she literally knocked everything from the table in front of us on the floor. And then she put a couple of cups of tea there and she went, now we can have a civilized moment. And um, I love her already. I just remembered that because I did need someone. I mean, I was, I just longed for someone to notice me because I felt so invisible in Austria. And um, and I, I've never forgotten that. Just now we can have a civilized moment. And um, I think that especially if you are bedridden, oh, people are sympathetic. They just want to come and help you or be with you or, or have a friend. And um, I think that sometimes uh, those of us who have had very difficult um, health situations or very difficult life situations, um, we're more compassionate usually for people and people really respond to your great compassion. You who you are is exactly who you're supposed to be in the scheme of things. And right where you are is the place you can bring light a candle in the darkness. I'm just so proud of you that you care to invite people. Don't worry about the messes. Everyone has messes. Yes. Some people may not know this, but you had your youngest child when you were forty two. Is that right? That's right. What blessings came with having a child in that season of life opposed to when you were younger? Well, I was, um, you know, much more at ease. I I didn't worry about every single uh, thing, every single stage of life. And I had three other children who were in the house, you know, running around. And um, also, I really enjoyed her so much. I knew that there would become a time when I wouldn't be able to cuddle her, rock her to sleep at night. 
kiss her, and, and she would put her little hand on me, and she would just go. Give the whole cats. time, nurse, you know, and I just love mommy. She'd kind of stop because I nursed her for a long time. And um, so I enjoyed her a lot more because by now I had fallen in love with my children and motherhood. And I thought, oh, this is a gift. I may never have this gift again. You wrote a book with your husband, Clay, called The Life-Giving Parent. Can you talk about why the 4- to 14-year-old range of children is so crucial for Christian parents in particular? You know, I there's so many things I could say. I would even say um, the first four years uh, you know, science is so very clear about attachment uh, yes. with children, you know, uh, being gentle, loving them, talking with them. Um, there's studies that have shown that when you kiss a child on the top of their head, their intelligence grows, their their receptivity to words and to language and to vocabulary. And I think the reason why we said 4 to 14, um, that was a lot to do with the fact that we wrote books on education. And that's usually when people become more serious about trying to educate their children. Um, and then to 14, because <clears throat> during those years, um, they're taking everything in as truth. They're in a great learning process. They're they're questioning things. They're they're curious. Uh, the average four year old asks a hundred questions uh, a day. Um, why is why is the sky blue instead of yellow? You know, I mean, um, <clears throat> because they're made to grow. But then when they get to those teenage years, sometimes eleven, twelve, thirteen, whatever, that's when they don't take everything in as truth. That's when they begin to think more um, philosophically. Yes. And, and so you and they, Clay, in The Life-Giving Parent, you guys wrote about how in those years from 4 to 14 years old, that's where it's so crucial to help them develop their theology and understand why they believe what they what they believe when it comes to faith. Because once right. they get into the teenage years, that's when you're starting to question everything. And then it's almost, it's way harder to then go in and, and try yeah. to develop that spiritual fruit, so to speak. Right, right. And uh, exactly, and I think we wanted to um, have an organic faith. We wanted it to be morning, noon, and night. Oh my goodness, who threw those stars in a place? Isn't this the beautiful night? Or I wonder what mood um, God was in when He made chili peppers, because I sure love my Mexican food. <laughs> and we would talk about our God as real because He was real to us. God was real to us. Yeah. Why is a philosophy statement something that all women should create for their families? I think that um, if you can really think through what you want to accomplish, what you believe, the direction that you want to go and what your values are, and I do it on a regular basis, the more deeply I can define what I believe is important in life and then make goals towards that end, the more likely I am to achieve what is important to me in my heart. Again, that's why the 15 minutes a day is so important, because you're thinking through what am I giving my life to? Um, how do I need to correct my course? Where am I having difficulty? And if you don't sit down and take that time to ponder, to think, to civilize for yourself, um, then you're really, um, without, without thinking through your philosophy and your goals and your ideals, uh, you probably won't have any place to go forward. You also discuss in The Life-Giving Parent how important it is to guard our children's hearts. Um, and I think one thing that Christian parents, especially today, are struggling with is, okay, I, I understand, especially with just the cultural rot happening, it, it, definitely all over the world, but especially in America right now, I want to guard my child's heart, but I also want to put them in positions to to be witnesses to other children and, and to share Jesus with people. How do you balance that? Um, I think that if a parent is healthy and strong, the child will be. Because if the child accompanies the parent, like we had a lot of people in our home and, and we took our children to homeless shelters or we took our children with us all over the world. Um, but I think it's real important to understand a little bit of child psychology and child educational um, levels. A, a child takes, they're, they're building their foundation of morality, of virtue, of what is right and what is wrong for a number of years. And so you want to give them hero tales. You want to give them virtuous things to do. That's why we wrote this book called The 24 Family Ways. Um, you're establishing for them what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. And um, you're establishing foundations of mommy and daddy are so happy that we have the Clarkson Club. We love being a family. 
families or the stability of the whole world. You know, we, we're verbalizing, we're teaching, we're instructing, because there comes a point where when they have a foundation that makes them secure of knowing what a good worldview is, um, what to think, how to believe, then they can go into the abstract thinking phase um, with, with everything sound. But it's so important for parents to understand it's not moral, moralism. Mm. It's not about what are the 10 rules I want them to learn. It's about you having integrity that when you say you love them, you're spending time with them, looking at their eyes, tickling their soft back at night when they go to sleep. Um, you know, you are being honest. You're asking them to forgive you when you are flawed. It's a, it's, it calls you to your best self to have to train and mentor another human being who is looking to you for truth. There were a lot of questions submitted about your son, Nathan, actually. Are you okay with answering questions about him? Oh, sure. He's he's amazing. He's one of my dearest in all the world friends. Yeah. So you're, and Nathan was diagnosed with OCD and ADD, correct? OCD, ADHD, ODD, you know, dyslexia. Yes. They'd like to know some advice on how you approached parenting a neurologically divergent child and then how you and your husband finally decided that medication was the best option. Um, we did not. Nathan did not have medication until he was an adult, okay. a young adult, um, because um, I, I read, I do always do a lot of reading. Whatever uh, your child specifically has, do a lot of reading and then have confidence in yourself. Um, we could see a lot of things that people would just um, say about Nathan that kind of group him in with with statistics. And I would think, no, no, he's kind of brilliant at this. Um, no, I don't think that would be good. Trust yourself to be the person that God is interested to be an authority over this child. Number two, um, it is very difficult to have neurodivergent children. And so you need to plan into your schedule a break, mm. um, you know, once in a while. Uh, see if there are friends in your life that will will love your child and ask them over to play with their children. And Nathan was, uh, everybody loved him. He was the Pied Piper. He, he had more difficulty even at home. Um, <clears throat> but I would say read everything you possibly can. But all children, all children and all adults, it's give them a foundation of love. And I would say, don't judge their motives. Um, if a neurodivergent child misbehaves or does something in an unusual way, um, look behind what they did and say, did they mean to be mean? Mm. Uh, did they mean to do this or that? Oh, no, this is a part of the part of their brain that doesn't work well. So don't judge your child um, as, as though that child is acting in the way that you would. Um, give them grace, uh, believe forward in their lives. You are very special to me. Love them, love them, love them. And give yourself grace because your child is not going to fit into the box in their world. What encouragement can you give a new mom who is struggling with an identity uh, away from her nine to five job? Let's say she's decided to be a stay-at-home mom now and this is so new for her, but she's struggling. She feels lost. I think that most women haven't been prepared to be mothers in this culture, and they don't have, they don't have that grandmother, the aunt, the <clears throat> cousins to support them. Um, so, number one, don't be critical of yourself. It is perfectly normal in any big adjustment in life, whether it's children, marriage, or whatever. And number two, some of the mundanity of taking care of a child by yourself can be very boring. Uh, it's okay. I mean, it's but it's going to grow you up. Um, when I look at my children, I realize that I thought I was so mature until I had children. <laughs> and, um, then I, you know, but I did fall in love with them. Um, and I, I began to realize that the, the shaping, uh, if you can build your ideals and, and um, your vision. It, when I held my daughter, I was almost 31. I was older when I got married. And um, all of a sudden, I thought, oh, my goodness, this is a human being. And um, it was as though God said to me, this, this precious little one will believe in my love when they're teenagers if you show them how I love throughout their lives. This child is somebody I've given in you into your hands as a real stewardship. Uh, they will become as intellectual as you, as you challenge them. They will become, if you can understand that this is a work of your lifetime, and you will like it better and better, and your child will sleep through the, 
the um, night one sometime, and um, they are a part of you. you. You you kind of give yourself time to fall in love with it, um, to to become excited about it, find a support group or some other women. But honestly, my children have called me to my best self mm. because I took them seriously. I thought, how can I shape them into the most excellent person they can possibly be? And so it caused me to grow. I thought, well, what is excellence? Well, what are great? Uh, what is great literature? Well, what are great experiences? And so when you make that transition, it will take a while, but it is the most affirming, affirming thing I've ever done. In other words, I've done a lot of things professionally, but my children are the best book I've ever written, and they are my best friends today. They just amaze me, honestly. I really loved this question that was submitted. It's for people who are currently living with in-laws or other friends or family members. They said, well, how can I create a life-giving home, Sally, in one room? Oh, my goodness. I, I am the queen of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've moved 24 times, and we've lived in tiny places and, and uh, big places. Um, and all you, all you have to do is light a candle and put on music. Um, you know, it, again, you are, um, you're kind of the magician that shapes the environment. Um, when my uh, girls, they were in different programs, but both of them were living in these very old rooms in Oxford, just tiny old rooms. And on their own, without talking to each other, um, one of them developed a, um, a wine and chocolate um, weekly meeting. Yes. And they, they um, you know, they had a little bit of food and they lit candles and put on music and they invited their friends in. They stuffed in on the beds. They sat on the floor. Um, and then the other one did something similar, you know, with, with treats and music and a book club. And um, because, because of our moves, possibly, I realized that beauty resides in your heart. And if you have an imagination for wherever I go, I'm going to bring a little bit of dimension or color, a little bit of myself, maybe some pictures of my family. Um, life-giving home. I, I lived with my in-laws, uh, my um, mother-in-law, for a while while we were getting our, our publishing house and ministry up and going. And uh, yes, it's taxing and it's, it can be difficult, but I did um, figure out how to make a little room here and there for all the special things that I thought were important. How do you make a home feel personalized and homey when you're on a budget? Well, goodness, I think that um, I think that the heart of a home is the heart of the person who's conducting the music there. Um, you know, the, the nice thing about where I live now in Oxford is that they're at what they call charity shops, and um, they're basically like a Goodwill or something. And um, I... I have found the most wonderful treasures. It's like treasure hunting. And um, no, nothing matches of mine in Oxford. Um, you know, I have a I have a funny looking tall teacup and a little one, short one. And, um, you know, it's because I, on my way walking to different places, I have to pass my favorite char charity shop. Um, but I have filled my home with treasures, um, you know, garage sales, uh, whatever, uh, Facebook. Um, What's it called? The, the Facebook marketplace. Place that, the marketplace, yes. Um, but I've just become um, a, a kind of a, I don't know, a, a, a person who is a treasure seeker. And you know and, what's um, so fun about going to somebody's home who does that? They do, they, they're a treasure seeker and they have all of these knickknacks and different paintings and books from all these different places and nothing matches. It's interesting to look at. It feels more homey and you get a sense of their personality. I think that Instagram has really, for millennials, for my generation, it has ruined this, um, I agree. this idea of being eclectic and having these different interests and things that don't match, which makes people interesting because we think of like our homes in the sense of this perfect curated feed, like we do on exactly. social media, where everything has to be beige, everything has to be white. And then you go to somebody's house like that and it you don't feel welcome. You don't feel like you're getting to know them. You know what I mean? There's nothing interesting to look at. I love going to people's houses where nothing matches and they have all these crazy books on the shelf or you have all these different broken teacups and things like that, but they all tell a story. Mm -hmm. And I think too, again, there's room for personality. Like if, if, if you really just want all beige or all blue or whatever, you can still find that at the charity shops or at the Facebook marketplace, <laughs> you know, but I do, um, I I totally agree with you. I think we are kindred spirits. 
Um, I think that when you have a house that tells a story, you know, whether it's 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 uh, going to, um, you know, some of the discount places and finding beautiful frames and then putting your favorite photographs in those pictures and people say, oh, where's that from? Or when did you do that? Or, um, you know, I collect calligraphy. I collect birds. Um, I collect um, some art. I collect, you know, different books, obviously. Um, but that's who I am. And I, I want my life to be broadly um, diverse, divergent. And um, I've grown a lot by going all over the world and seeing things. I actually have a library. I have to tell you real quick. This is Clay's. Mine is upstairs. But on my wall in the library, I started gathering pictures that represented everything that was of value to me. Ooh. Uh, like uh, one of the pictures is uh, from Austria that I got in a secondhand shop. And and um, I, I put that up because I care in, about international issues. And it's a it was a famous artist that I got at a secondhand shop. And then I have a picture of children. And then I have a picture of mountains because I love nature. And then I have a picture of scripture. And I, anyway, if you looked at this wall, it would be like looking at the inside of my heart. Yeah. Because I wanted to be able to say to people, this is, this is what I care about. And it was really fun collecting them and putting all of the different things together. And um, so it was a lot of fun for me. Sally, I saw the coolest thing the other day. There was a family where their child had gotten a crayon or something and started drawing on the wall. And they oh, were wow. <laughs> they were drawing like they were making a little house. And when the parents saw that the child had, you know, drawn on the wall and ruined, ruined the wall in the home, they interrupted <laughs> them, obviously, to tell them to stop. Well, instead of taking a magic eraser and erasing the flaw now that was on their living room wall, they decided to get this teeny tiny picture frame and put it over the house. And then they put a little marker like you would see at a museum w with the title of the painting and who the artist was. And so they wrote, oh, inter wonderful. <laughs> they wrote Interrupted House by so-and-so, their child's name, the year. And I just thought, how funny is that? Now when people come over, that is a hilarious thing to be like, what do you think about our art? It's like this, you know, drawing that their kid had started drawing on the wall instead of trying I to cover it up. Those are funny <laughs> things to, to embrace those flaws of life or things that we would think of as a flaw and be like, this is funny and it's interesting and it's conversation and it shows that we live here. People are too yeah. afraid to have this standard of having a perfect home and I can't invite anyone over unless I, you know, everything matches and everything's perfect all the time. And I think those are the things that people like about you. Well, I just love your heart. I, I really think that we're getting back to something else is that don't listen to the voices. Um, it, everybody has a unique fingerprint. They have unique DNA uh, because we were made to be ourselves. And and the more you can love who you are, in in a in a good sense, and say this is who I am, and this is what I cook, and this is my house that I you know put a little frame out, and I bet that child is so affirmed. Oh thinking yes, that, you know I am an artist, but <laughs> I do think that um, you know the voices in your head can create havoc, and can keep you from just enjoying uh, the fact that you are. You're just a real person. Your feet are made of clay, but you can still create joy. One of the most special things my dad ever did for me was surprise me with a trip to see Coldplay, which was my favorite band at the time when I was 16. It was so thoughtful and out of nowhere, and it just meant a whole lot to me. I still remember it to this day. Maybe things haven't been great with your teenager, okay? You desperately need to spend quality time with them and bond, but you just have no idea what to do that would be fun for both of you. May I suggest Turning Point USA's Young Women's Leadership Summit. It would also be a dynamite graduation gift, by the way. Mom or dad, take your daughter to YWLS to hear from the biggest speakers in the conservative movement like Ali Stuckey, Candace Owens, Kaylee McEnany, Yomni Park, Laura Ingram, and Carrie Lake, to name a few. The production value is insane. She's going to feel like she's at a concert. Thousands of young women from across the country will be there. And if you're not a parent bringing someone, but you're just a woman wanting to go, all ages are welcome at tpusa.com slash YWLS. You'll find all frequently asked questions there. That's tpusa.com slash YWLS with code POPLITICS for a discount on tickets. The event is coming up soon in a couple weeks, so plan this ASAP. It's June 9th through 11th in Dallas, Texas at the Gaylord. Just click the link in the description.
if you were to create a beginner kit to homemaking and you were going to give that to a new bride as a gift, like at a bridal shower, what would you include in that kit? Um, oh, well, I'm like uh, Marie Antoinette. I'm not very practical. <laughs> but um, I would probably include a little tea can, uh, a tea tin. That they have, you know, those in, in Europe where you keep your tea and your sugar. I give her a little can of tea with a, with a, a cup and say, enjoy, uh, you know, enjoy yourself every day. Take time to civilize your soul. I would have a candle. I would probably have some kind of um, music or, or a, a list of streaming um, playlists that I loved. Um, I would probably, mm, let me think, a, a book. I would probably say this is one of my favorite books. What's your um, favorite devotional? Oh, I don't have a favorite. I just, um, I take recommendations for people. I have a whole basket of devotions and I, I kind of you know, whatever mood I'm in, I, I draw from them. I've I've read so many books over the years, but um, I've I have about fifty, but not just one. <laughs> yeah, normalize being a book hoarder. I like my book, the my devotional for moms, the best, the mom heart moments. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm teasing. No, that's I wrote, great. I wrote short little devotionals so that moms could take two minutes to encourage themselves during the day. What uh, encouragement can you give mothers that are fe- feeling overwhelmed? by keeping the home. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, you know, I think that uh, my kids said that the angriest I ever got was when I would walk into the kitchen to a pile of dishes um, because I would just feel overwhelmed. But I would say, um, you know, again, it's I, I finally I was washing dishes one day and I realized, OK, these dishes represent the fact that we have the life giving table where we have rousing discussions and Everybody loves my cooking, and and they're they've all become best friends. And so a part of it is you know just accept it; it's going to happen, um, and it's a part of life. Second thing is that I set real um, rhythms in my house. Like every day at five o'clock, I would put on kind of you know rhythmic music, and I'd say, okay, that fifteen minutes is turned on, and I would make everyone go and start sorting out, cleaning, straightening up rooms, so that at the end of my day, it wouldn't be overwhelming to me. Um, I had a, a one day a week when we would vacuum, clean bathrooms, do whatever. I didn't do it every day. Um, I gave my children, instead of different chores, I would say, you are always going to set the table every night the rest of your life because I can't remember chore charts. <laughs> and then the other one would empty the dishwasher. You know, or whatever. In other words, I, I put together some systems that um, for just a very few minutes or a one time a week, um, we could move in the direction of going from chaos to order. And of course, it was always in and out of chaos because uh, we had real life people who lived there. But it's funny to me today, though, because I, I think, were they listening? Were they watching me? And now when I go into their homes, they're wonderful. But it doesn't always look like anybody's listening to you at the time. Mm, yeah, that's that's a very good point. I, well, and also they might give you, they might uh, meet you with defiance and then later they understand that you were right. I think that's more the case with my mom and I trying to get me to do things or understand things. And I was like, I don't need to do that. I, I can do it my own way. And now that I'm, I just turned 30, I'm like, oh, she was for sure right about that. You, you kind of learned that. Ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now you have been married, have you been married for over 40 something years now? Yeah, I th- it's either 42 or 43. I could ask my <laughs> husband in the other office. <laughs> 42, 43 years of marriage, multiple kids. How <laughs> did you find the time to make sure that you were still putting him first? I didn't put him first. <laughs> Tell us about the mistake <laughs> of, of moments that you didn't. He was out of first. You know what okay. I mean is, um, you know, when I, when I look at life, somebody once told me that when you look at a pendulum, it's only in balance at one point. And then you, you, you're moving from imbalance to balance. But um, I mean, he was, he was always a priority in my heart um, as my children were. I, I had a place of sacredness for them. But um, I've kind of, I've been writing about this lately. So um, here's a spoiler alert. You'll read it in, my, in one of my next books. But um, we used to love watching the Olympics, the ice skaters, mm-hmm. you know, the, the ones that did the dancing and throwing each other. They're all partners and stuff. And I kind of compare marriage to that. It's it's a long journey. It's about partnership, but you you have to learn how to dance with the other person. You have to learn to intuit them. There are a lot of falls and a lot of bruises, um, but if you if you focus your heart towards who is this person and what are they really like, um, how can I make time for them? Now I will say, and people are going to think I'm crazy. Um, 
when my husband would come home from his office, now we have our offices in our house, but I I would um, make him a cup of tea and I would say, tell me about your day. And um, just having the chance to settle down, to share the stresses. And now we do have a, a tea time every afternoon around four o'clock. Um, now that we're working in the house, I work upstairs, he works downstairs. Um, but I made um, I made moments of intimacy for our friendship to grow. Uh, we all had dinner together every single night. You know, I mean, obviously, as they got older, they had meetings. But what I mean is, if it was a bowl of Cheerios or if it was just a piece of toast and cheese, we'd light the candles, put music on. But we provided times for our relationship. And um, we used to go out and when we first got married for several years, we would have breakfast once a week and uh, do planning and talk to each other about everything. So our whole marriage was built on making time for companionship and friendship. How, Does that make sense? Yes. How was the transition going from having all these little kids in the house to everyone's grown up now and now you're in the season of your marriage where, oh, it's just us again? How was the transition for you? Was it, was it easy? Did it come easy or was it difficult? I think all transitions are somewhat difficult, and our children um, were all here. I mean, we we had them here for so long, and it was so much fun, and they were a lot of focal point of our lives. But I actually live in Oxford, where three of my children and three of my grandchildren live, which is a great reason for why I'm there. <laughs> um, but I think that um, because my husband and I are both very idealistically driven, we're, we very we feel like until we're either senile or we go, get to go see the Lord. Um, we have people to minister to, books to write, things to do. And we built our partnership around um, having an influence on the world for light and beauty and goodness. And so I am, I'm very grateful that I've worked. Sometimes I need to tone it down a little bit. But I would say our work um, really inspires us. And we spend a lot of time and a lot of money to go spend time with our kids. Yeah, we, we, They're our best friends. And so we still invest in them. But I wanted my kids to flourish and to have a life and to pursue what they wanted to pursue. That was, you know, I, I think that was in my heart all along. So I would give graces. They they don't need me to be to mommy them. They don't need me to tell them what to do. They are adults. I will ask them what they think I should do. So it was a, a an understanding that there would be a point at which I needed to say, go fly. Has, and I will be your best cheerleader. Has there been anything recently that uh, surprised you some really good advice that one of your adult children gave you? Oh, yeah. I mean, they feel free to give me advice all the time. <laughs> now. Uh, but I asked them to speak into my life. And um, all my children are kind of in the writing world, too. So they give me advice in publishing and um, advice on uh, actually the best advice they've given to me is setting boundaries. Mm. Uh, you know, Mom, you really need to just... Um, Put that aside. You don't have to answer every letter. You don't have to help every person in the world. Um, you know, just it, don't feel guilty if you close the door on meeting that need. So they really um, helped me a lot to set boundaries and to protect our time so that we can have time alone where no one's looking and no one is inside the circle. What are some above and beyond special things that you can do for an overnight guest? Um, we kind of have this tradition where first when they walk in the door, there's a welcome sign. And sometimes we even erase the little board and put welcome Shirley or welcome Bill or whatever it is, you know, with their, their name. Um, when we, when they go upstairs in their room, they'll find a little card that says, I'm so happy that you came to see us. Um, or, you know, we're so glad, whatever you want to see on the card. There's always a little bowl of chocolates and probably some roasted, um, salted nuts of some kind and two or three bottles of water and towels laid out on the bed. And then something that I've learned because I travel a lot and go places, I think people need leadership. And by that, what I mean is they need to know, we're going to have dinner tonight at six o'clock. If you are hungry before then, here's the coffee maker. Here is, you know, here are some snacks for you. Because I've been places where I would be upstairs in the guest room and I would go, I don't know when we're going to eat again and I'm starving or, you know, I really needed a this or that. Is it okay for me to ask? Am I interrupting the people? So I think just guiding people and saying, this is my schedule. I'll be out in just a minute. Clay will be home at this time. Does that make sense? So yes, a little itinerary. In, yeah. It putting them at ease. And that's what I mean by leading them to know what to expect. That's great advice. 
All right. So what are your what are some of your favorite conversations recently that you've had on your podcast at home with Sally that you really recommend cute conservatives go check out St- stuff that just really stuck with you lately? Um, I I don't have a lot of people on my podcast because I travel so much. I may not always have the right microphone. I don't have the beautiful setup that you have, but I do occasionally have some uh, people on there. And I just did a, a recording a, a little bit ago and um it was actually about the Tea Time Discipleship, but there was a, a really sweet woman that I enjoy so much. And um, she's right in the trenches. She has four kids and a business, and they're building a house. And she said, how do you include all of these things? Why do these values ma- matter? And we had the most uh, wonderful conversation about um, how do you become an excellent, civilized, um, uh, intelligent um, you know, life-giving home uh, professional woman. And um, we talked a lot about what it looks like to make goals, to have time, to work on yourself, because people are going to be drawing from you your whole life. And we talked about that. It was a great talk. Where can people get Tea Time Discipleship, your brand new book? They can get it at, on, on Amazon, on almost any bookstore that you would want to order it through. Um, you can even get it in England before we were able to get it here. <laughs> um, so I, I, any place that they want to, and they can find out all about it on sallyclarkson.com, where we have a book summary page and some um, some pre-order gifts that they'll, will be there for a long time. Fabulous. And that'll be linked in the description notes. So if you're listening and you want to just click right there, you'll have a link right to her podcast, to her book, all of her fabulous things, her website, all of that. Miss Sally, as always, it is a pleasure to speak with you. You're one of my absolute favorite guests to have on the spillover. Oh, spill I'm so honored. Well, I love speaking with you. We could have so much fun. I uh, could... I would just be beside myself to stop by at some point if I'm ever in your neck of the woods to see your lovely bookshelf. Well, you must come. I, I, I would love to have you, and I would I would make you whatever you prefer to drink, and we would have fun talking. Thank you, Miss sure. Sally. Thank you so much, too. It was great to be here today. We love Sally so much on this show. She has so much wisdom to give, and I feel like this audience is so blessed to be able to hear from her not just once, but twice now. And I believe the only other people that I've had on twice are former FBI serial killer profiler Jim Clemente, and then conservative commentator and host of Human Events Daily, Jack Posobiec. If you have not heard my first interview with Sally from last December, it is all about how to make a life-giving home, and it will make you want to transform your place. Whether you live in a one-bedroom apartment, your in-law's basement, or a mansion, you will learn from Sally how to create a space that just pours life into anyone who comes in contact with it. Her new book, Tea Time Discipleship, is in the show notes. It is a beautiful book for yourself, or it is a fantastic gift for someone. If you've got a birthday or housewarming party coming up, please leave a five-star review for this episode to support the show. Next week, our May is for the Mom series is going overseas. It's another international episode, baby. We are talking to an etiquette expert from the land of tea and crumpets and why state media decided to accuse her of white supremacy just because because she wanted to stay at home and be a wife and a mom. Yes, I am dead serious. It is a wild story. You're going to love it. Look for that on The Spillover next Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, anywhere you get your podcasts. All interviews are available to watch if you subscribe to Politics on YouTube. I'm Alex Clark, and this is The Spillover. Love you, mean it, bye. Bye.